Good evening. Good evening. I'm Jennifer Rabb and have the extraordinary privilege of serving as the president of this phenomenal institution, Hunter College, where the American dream still comes true and the home of the Roosevelt House Public Policy Institute. Speaking as well for our Jonathan Fanton Director of Roosevelt House, Harold Holzer, it is a pleasure to welcome all of you to an exciting night in celebration of the publication of a brand new translation of Arthur Kessler's 1940 classic, Darkness at Noon. We gather this evening to discuss and appreciate this remarkable work of literature in a truly remarkable place, the house which Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt received as a combination wedding and Christmas present from his mother Sarah back in 1908. As many of you probably know, Franklin recovered from polio here in 1921, went on to run in his 1928 gubernatorial campaign from the House, and then four years later ran for president. President-elect Franklin Roosevelt came through the door where you entered today on the steps where he found his mother Sarah waiting to tell him that night that he, that was the happiest day of her life. Roosevelt made this building his transition headquarters from November 1932 to the beginning of March 1933, when, by the tradition of the day, inaugurations took place. It was here that Franklin Roosevelt named Frances Perkins the very first woman to ever serve in a United States presidential cabinet, and here that together they agreed to expand the model program of old aid pensions they had introduced in Albany, a program that came to be known as Social Security. It was also here that they added to the reform program minimum wage and child labor laws. And it was here that the outlines of the rest of the New Deal were devised by the Brain Trust that met upstairs in the President-elect's library every day from the election to the inauguration, which included the Federal Writers Project, which supported thousands of writers, editors, and researchers. And it was here that Eleanor Roosevelt became the global voice for human rights that later guided the Universal Declaration of Human Rights toward adoption by the United Nations, which of course she began working on at the Bronx Hunter College campus after World War II and before the UN built and moved into its own headquarters in Manhattan. Because of her, Roosevelt House became a gathering spot for human rights heroes from around the world. That tradition we are proud to continue to this day. Roosevelt House has welcomed recently for its, to its undergraduate human rights program the Dalai Lama, Elie Wiesel, Vakla Havel, Congressman John Lewis, Nobel Peace Prize laureate Dennis Mukhegi, and just last week, Roosevelt House received a visit from the President of Hungary, Arthur Kessler's home country. Tonight's event is animated by that history, a history that goes back more than 75 years, deep into the legacy of progressive politics and the fight to uplift and protect human dignity and human rights. One night in February of 1951, Eleanor Roosevelt took a break from that fight and went up to 52nd Street to see a Broadway play. If she had hoped for an evening away from the troubles of the world, what she got was a vivid journey deep into the horrors of the human rights abuse. That play was the stage adaptation of Darkness at Noon, which had been recommended to her by none other than the play's producer, who was a guest on her radio program earlier that afternoon. He told her that she would not want to miss the Tony, miss the Tony Award winning performance by Claude Rains as the novel's hero whose imprisonment and torture under Stalinist rule is devastatingly depicted. Afterwards, Eleanor wrote in her column, My Day, that she had, quote, rarely been to a play that gripped harder and that the play, quote, should make many of us Americans more aware of the need for preservation of our liberties. She was, in fact, so affected by the play that she went back to see it a second time, later that same month, this time taking her grandson and his wife. After that, she again wrote about it in my, in my day. I had seen the play before she wrote, but I felt that its lessons were such a powerful one that perhaps it would be well to see it again. What she must have seen on the stage of the Alvin Theater during those two performances was a portrayal of precisely the kind of gross injustice and degradation that the, human, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was intended to prevent. At least she could watch knowing that it had just been officially adopted by the UN just a little more than a year earlier, and that with it in its place, such stories would no longer need telling. 
But what brings us here tonight isn't just the book, Dark This at Noon, but the serendipitous discovery in 2015 by a German doctoral student of the original German manuscript, previously thought to have been lost at the outbreak of World War II. We are all the happy beneficiaries of this exciting discovery, which our esteemed guest, Philip, Philip Baum, Baum, has, I'm going to, Baum, I got it right. Okay, Philip Baim has translated into a vital new version full of nuance and detail that had otherwise been lost to history. As our other esteemed guest, Michael Scalma, put it in the New York Review of Books, reading this translation will be like seeing a cleaned oil painting for the first time after the old and discolored varnish has been removed. New details will come into view. The brushwork will be more discernible and our understanding of the novel as literature, independent of its time and subject matter, will be enormously enhanced. Today, Dark to Set Noon remains much more relevant than Eleanor, or the rest of us would have hoped. Human rights atrocities continue under, under undemocratic governments around the world. And so, to discuss the book, the translation, and its enduring relevance, I am pleased to welcome our distinguished panelists, award-winning playwright, theater director, and translator Philip Baim, author of Kessler, The Literary and Political Odyssey of a 20th Century Skeptic, Michael Scammell, who also provides the introduction to the new edition, and to moderate tonight's discussion, poet, editor at the review section of the Wall Street Journal, and a frequent contributor to The New Yorker, Adam Kirsch, whose books of literary criticism include The People and the Books, 18 Classics of Jewish Literature. We are so grateful this evening also to longtime neighbors and supporters of Hunter College's mission, Daniel Shookman and his wife, Lori Lesser, a longtime supporter and member of our pre-law board for co-sponsoring tonight's event. Dan and Lori embody the Hunter motto, Nihi Korafatori, the care of the future is mine. They're great supporters of our students and great helpers of the Hunter mission. We're so happy that they've been great neighbors, and we want to ask Dan and Lori to stand so we can just say thank you to you. <laughs> Dan recently helped bring an important documentary on free speech, Can We Take a Joke, which was talking about how comedians were no longer welcome on college campuses, and Lori, as I said, has been a leader in our pre-law program. So we thank to Dan and Lori. We welcome this esteemed panel. We look forward to your conversation. Harold, thank you so much for putting together this extraordinary program, and welcome to all. Thank you, President Rabb, and thank you, Harold, and thank you all for coming tonight. Um, I'm Adam Kirsch, and I thought maybe we would start by asking the translator, Philip Baim, to read a uh, passage from his new translation of Darkness at Noon give us a flavor of what the book now sounds like. It'll just be a brief passage. And it's from early in the book. All the corridors of the magnificent new prison were equipped with pallid electric bulbs that barely lit the iron walkways, the stark whitewashed walls, the cell doors with the names and the black holes for spying. The dull, lackluster light and the shrill acoustics of their steps on the stone tile floor seemed so familiar that for a few seconds Rubashov toyed with the illusion that he was once again dreaming. He tried to persuade himself that he actually believed this. If you can convince yourself you're only dreaming, then it really will be just a dream, he thought. He wanted this so badly that he nearly got dizzy, but then right away he felt a suffocating sense of shame. I have to swallow it all with decency down to the end, he thought, even if I wind up choking on the last crumb. Meanwhile, they had reached cell number 404. A card was hanging over the spy hole with his name, Nikolai Salmanovich Rubashov. The sight of his name on the card moved him deeply. They've prepared everything beautifully, he thought. He wanted to ask the guard for an extra blanket on account of his rheumatism, but the cell door was already clanging shut behind him. The warder squinted through the spy hole at regular intervals, but Rubashov lay still on his cot, except for his hand which occasionally twitched in his sleep. 
On the tiles beside the cot were his pince-nez and a cigarette butt. At seven in the morning, two hours after being taken to his cell, Rubashov was awakened by a blast from a bugle. He had slept straight through the two hours without dreaming and was immediately alert. The bugle sounded three times, the same blaring notes in a minor sequence. The tones reverberated for a long time, then faded out, giving way to a hostile silence. The day was just beginning. The pre-dawn light softened the contours of the tin bucket and the wash basin. The bars on the window were silhouetted black against the dull glass. A broken pane on the top left had been covered with newspaper. Rubashov sat up, reached for his pince-nez and the cigarette stub and lay back down. He put on his pince-nez and lit the stub. The silence persisted. All the men in this whitewashed hive of cells were undoubtedly getting up from their bunks, cursing and feeling their way across the floor, but no sound reached the prisoners in the isolation unit except for the occasional steps echoing down the corridor. Rubashov knew he was in an isolation cell and that he'd remain there until they shot him. He ran his fingers through his short, pointed beard, smoked, and lay still on his cot. So they're going to shoot you, he thought. He blinked and stared at his foot, which was sticking straight up at the other end of the blanket. He noticed his big toe was moving. He felt warm, snug, and secure, and very tired. He didn't mind the idea of dozing off into death as long as they let him lie under the warm blanket. So they're going to shoot us he repeated in his thoughts. He slowly wiggled his toes inside his sock and was reminded of a poem that compared Christ's feet to a white deer in a thorn bush. He rubbed his pince-nez on his sleeve in his usual manner, a gesture well known to his followers. Under the warm blanket, his happiness was near complete. The only thing he feared was having to get up and move. So they're going to snuff us out, he said to himself quietly and lit a new cigarette although he only had three left. Sometimes the first cigarettes on an empty stomach gave him a slight urge of pleasure, a slight surge of pleasure, and he was already feeling a little giddy, a sensation he knew well from earlier brushes with death. He also realized that this sensation was objectionable and from a certain perspective impermissible, but for the moment he had no desire to embrace that point of view. Instead, he watched the play of his stockinged toes and smiled behind his pince-nez. He felt a warm wave of sympathy with, with his body, which he otherwise did not love, and his impending destruction filled him with a compassionate lust. The old guard is dead, he said out loud. We are the last ones. They're going to snuff us out, he told himself. Come, sweet death. He tried to recall the melody of come, sweet death, but all that came to him were the words. The old guard is dead he repeated, and attempted to recall their faces. He only succeeded with a few. All he could remember of the first president of the Internationale, who had been executed as a traitor, was a patch of his checkered vest worn over a somewhat paunchy stomach. The man never wore suspenders, always leather belts. The first head of the revolutionary state, also executed, used to chew his nails in moments of danger. History will rehabilitate you, Rubashov thought without special conviction. What does history know of chewed nails? Rubashov smoked and thought about his dead comrades, about the humiliation that had preceded their death. Even so, he could not bring himself to hate number one, although he had often looked at the oil print above his bed and tried. Among themselves, they had given him many names, but in the end, what stayed was number one. The dread that emanated from number one consisted, above all, in the possibility that he was right, and that all the people he killed had to concede he might be right, even as the bullet went into their neck. Absolute certainty did not exist, only a mocking oracle they called history, which would not deliver its verdict until long after the jawbones of the ones seeking counsel had turned to dust. Come, sweet death. Thank you. Um, I thought I would start, since we're reading a passage about, about prison and the novel set, 
during Rubashov's uh, last days of his life in a prison. Um, it's a, the book is a product of two stories that sort of intersect. One of them is the story of the Bolsheviks, the old Bolsheviks who were tried in the Moscow trials and killed by Stalin, 1936, 37, 38. The other story is Kessler's own experience in prison um, in 1937. So I thought, Michael Scammell, maybe you could tell us a bit about how it was that Kessler came to be imprisoned and how that led to the writing of this book. Well, uh, is that about the right place to hold it? Uh, yes. Um, well, one has to remember that Kessler himself was a passionate communist for some years before the Spanish Civil War. And he was there officially as a correspondent, but unofficially also as a representative of Moscow and the Communist Party and sending information back. So uh, during the Spanish Civil War, he was officially a correspondent for the English newspaper, the News Chronicle. Uh, but uh, secretly, as I say, he was reporting to Moscow. Well, uh, Franco's nationalist uh, troops and police knew a thing or two, and they knew uh, that Kessler was doing this, on, uh, as it were, as his secret job. And he was arrested in Malaga and put in jail in Seville, uh, where he spent four months altogether. Uh, he heard and saw, that is, through the, uh, some of the windows when he was uh, in other parts of the prison, people being led out and executed. And he thought that he himself would be executed as well. Luckily, as an international case, uh, he was, in fact, rescued by British who intervened on his behalf and said he's a correspondent for the News Chronicle, and for whatever reason, the, the, fascist, the, Sp the Spanish fascist, fascist let him out. Uh, he wrote a very, very good book, the one that Adam mentioned, Dialogue with Death, which I hope, to all those publishers who are here, uh, will be reissued, because I really think it's one of his best. Uh, and in fact... Uh, Jean-Paul Sartre made him an honorary existentialist on the basis <laughs> of this book. Um, so this was, this. Uh, you wanted the Spanish part. I, I, I can't resist adding one thing. Um, a very important part of, dialogue, uh, of uh, Darkness at Noon is Rubashov peeping through the peephole to see what's going on in the corridor and what's happening elsewhere. Well, this is actually a false step. In the Soviet Union, the cells did not have a two-way peephole. You could only look from outside in. The guards could look in, but the prisoner couldn't look out. But in Spain, it was a two-way peephole. So this made its way into darkness at noon, but it was not a fact. Not, well, luckily, it's a novel, so it doesn't matter. Philip, could you tell us how it came to be? We, we heard um, in President Rab's introduction that this book is based on the rediscovered original German manuscript typescript of Darkness at Noon, um, which Kessler wrote in very harried circumstances around the time of the outbreak of the Second World War. Could you tell us a little bit about how the book was written, when it was written, and how that manuscript came to be lost? Well, Michael may know more <clears throat> about that in detail than I, but my understanding is he was writing it, and he began writing it in the late 30s after the show trials the, in, in Moscow, and um, he was, necessarily in Paris, having f had to flee the Nazi Germany, and actually, I guess he never went back to, to Nazi Germany, but... Um, uh, he, no, no, he didn't. No. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, just as he was writing this book, and Daphne Hardy was living with him, uh, translating at the same time that he was writing it, um, and then it, it was almost like a scene out of Casablanca, is how I imagine it, um, there... The, the, you know, the, the Germans were wearing gray, what's the line? And, uh, and, and we're translating and writing Darkness at Noon. Um, and so they, the Germans come and uh, they have to flee and in the commotion, they, they send, Daphne Hardy sends her translation to the British publisher and he sends his, uh, a copy of his manuscript to a German publisher in Switzerland. But in the commotion, the original manuscript is lost and then We'll fast forward several decades, and Michael can explain how exactly the original resurfaced. Uh, yes. Um, 
I, I'd like to add uh, 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 to the Paris, um, the Paris um, episodes when he was writing the novel that ironically at one point he was arrested by the French police uh, as an enemy alien, uh, but in this case the idea was that he was a German uh, spy and sent to a concentration camp in the south of France, which was so lax that he was able actually to continue <coughs> writing Darkness at Noon while he was in that camp. Uh, the discovery of the, uh, uh, of the manuscript is, is rather fascinating. Uh, this young German student called Matthias Wessel uh, was writing a doctoral thesis in which he was trying to prove to the Germans or show that Kostler was actually a major German writer before he became an English writer. Uh, uh, because there were, there were, apart from Darkness at Noon, there was an earlier novel um, called, called The Gladiators in English. Uh, he had written uh, a, a couple of plays, he'd written a children's novel. So he had quite, uh, and he'd written, um, he'd written about Spain uh, beforehand too. So, um, Matthias was actually looking to document this, and he was also looking up such things as circulation figures. And he was looking for the circulation figure of a book that Kessler wrote, uh, a kind of propaganda book attacking um, Franco's Spain. And uh, he came across a folder labeled Rubashov. Now, as far as he knew, oh, and it said Rubashov, a novel. And Matthias knew that there was no such novel by Kessler called Rubashov. However, uh, he realized that Rubashov was the name of the main character in Darkness at Noon. So he ordered the, uh, he ordered the manuscript from the library archives, started to read it, and realized at once that he had actually come across. I say the original. Uh, it's a complicated history because the actual uh, typescript in in, in um, Zurich is a carbon copy, and the original original copy has been lost, as far as I know. One of the things that makes Kessler's story uh, such a important and representative twentieth century story is that, if I'm not mistaken, he was in the jails of three different countries in the space of three years. He was arrested by the fascists in Spain in 1937. He was arrested by the French as an enemy alien in 1939, and he was arrested by the British when he managed to escape from, uh, from Nazi-occupied France to Britain. He was arrested as an illegal alien and a, a foreign national there as well. And all this was because he was stateless. He had been rendered stateless after mm -hmm. Hitler's takeover of Germany. Um, before 1933, Kessler had been a very successful journalist for newspaper, um, and I, I owe this all to you, so I'm, I'm, I give you full credit. Um, I, I'm checking you as you go along. Right. <laughs> and, and he was a, a journalist specializing in science, science news in particular. And later in his career, he would come back to writing about science. Um, he went to the Soviet Union. He joined the Communist Party, uh, went to the Soviet Union in 1932. And while he was there, Hitler took over in Germany, and he was not able to return because he was a Jew and a communist. Mm. He ended up in Paris, and that's why he was there when he wrote Darkness at Noon. But... One of the interesting questions that, uh, that it raises is he was arrested in Spain as a communist and was being imprisoned by fascists. A couple of years later, he decides to write a story about a communist imprisoned by communists. In other words, he's, cha he's changed the focus. He's drawing on his own experience, but now he's turned his criticism against the side that he used to be on. Um, why do you think that was? What made him change his mind about communism in that period of time? Well, uh, he was hugely uh, influenced by the show trials in 1936, 1937 of so many Soviet leaders, and the one who's most often, often mentioned is Nikolai Bukharin, who was within the, those terms of the Communist Party, a, re a relative liberal, I mean, more liberal than, than some of the others. Um, and I think, well, Kessler, after these, these trials took place, uh, and after the, the Spanish experience, he decided to resign from the Communist Party. 
Uh, but he announced it at a meeting of the Germanist Writers Association in, in Paris. And uh, he pretty much announced that he was, not only that he was leaving the party, but he was gonna write about it. And I, my, my view, one view of the novel is that Kessler wrote it to, to prove to himself that he was right in leaving the party and to analyze all the various things that, that went into that uh, decision. So it was actually, it was a kind of mea culpa, uh, except that he had not been in the position of an actual leader, but he had agreed with those leaders. And is it true also that in Spain he witnessed the infighting and the fact that the Stalinist-led communists were so against the POUM, the, the Trotskyites, and he probably witnessed all of this and, and saw the, yes. the, the, the ramifications of that infighting? Well, and, and as, a, as a kind of agent, he realized that the Soviet Union was pulling the strings. It was uh, in their interests to have these different factions and also to try and put the Communist Party ahead of the other socialist parties. Philip, we often talk about the book and, and we'll probably continue to talk about the book tonight as a novel about politics and ideas. What is it like as a work of literature, particularly reading it in German, um, what kind of a writer is Kessler? Well, as Michael said, he's a journalist uh, originally, but this book was written with some, some speed and a lot of urgency, and I think that urgency is found in the in in the text, and I hope it's captured in in this translation, as it was undoubtedly also captured in the earlier translation. Um, the urgency, uh, of course, being related to the time in which he's he's writing, um, as literature, uh, for me the most interesting aspect is this this character Rubashov. There's a um, he's a a flawed character, but this flaw comes from his very humanity. He's someone who is so deeply devoted to an ideal, someone uh, whose vision clouds his sight ultimately, um, and whose uh, convictions uh, overtake his compassion. And I think that, that, that person in that novel reads both in the German and, and here. So from a literary point of view, that's interesting to me. Um, the style is uh, pretty much straightforward in, in German. Um, it's a it's a it's a style. It's not um, uh, it's not Baroque by any means. Um, it is German, so it has a lot of dependent clauses, uh, <laughs> and and so I think that probably one difference I'm trying to do is is make it flow a little more uh, and capture some of the speed that I think German readers perhaps automatically go through, but we, we don't, so. Um, this, uh, this book was the product, as, as you said, of an anti-communist, a communist turned anti-communist, and Kessler, after having been a communist through the 1930s, became a very prominent anti-communist for the rest of his life in the 1940s and 50s. Um, what, um, we, we talked about the role of the Spanish Civil War and the infight in the Spanish Civil War. What do you think when in trying to get into the mind of someone like Bukharin, because this is, the character of Rubashov is based somewhat closely on, on Bukharin, and in, indeed there are some, uh, in this edition, Bukharin's speech and his defense at, the, at his trial in Moscow is printed as an appendix, and you can see that Kessler has taken almost word for word some lines from that speech and assigned them to Rubashov. Um, was he trying to give us sympathy with this this communist leader? Was he trying to make us see him, as you say, as a sympathetic figure, or was he trying to turn the reader against a figure like Rubashov, do you think? I think probably a combination. I mean, we're, we see his flaws, we can identify with, with, with flaws, um, we, and with, his, th with the inner debate that he, uh, we, we, we read a lot, there's a lot of rumination in the book, which is also a challenge for translating. Um, but I think that we're supposed to sympathize and, and through that sympathy understand, um, maybe not forgive, but understand. Yeah. Uh, so, and, and lest we uh, ourselves uh, fall victim to that same uh, ideological uh, track. Could I uh, come in on that? Yes. Um, I think that uh, what one has to realize, well, uh, I sort of touched on it before, uh, 
Kessler was himself turning against communism, communism as it was practiced at least. Uh, but one of the things that comes through, and I think one of the difficulties with the translator is, that he actually was steeped in Marxist and Marxist-Leninist ideology. And the book is a miracle. I think what you felt about sympathy, by the way, the book is a miracle in that, uh, and this got him into some trouble, by the way, that is one of the best cases for communism that's ever been made uh, <laughs> through the figure of uh, Rubashov. He, he is a sympathetic figure, and he's steeped in the ideology, and he's committed a lot of uh, what we would call crimes in the, in, in the name of the party. So um, uh, from that point of view, uh, he is, he is uh, re-examining his own early communism. And by the way, I, and I'd like to make a point here which is very important. Uh, it wasn't just an anti-communist book. It was an anti-authoritarian book, an anti-totalitarian -tot book. Um, in the book itself, there are many references to Hitler and to Nazi Germany. And Kersler goes out of his way not to name the country in which it takes place, although it's obvious with number one and so on, and, and, the, and the sort of realia of the novel are, are, are Soviet. So he, he pulled off this, uh, to my mind, it was an amazing feat. He, and because he was actually putting forward, uh, some of his old comrades, by the way, uh, other anti-communists, uh, attacked him for this. They said, this is too attractive a picture of an original Bolshevik because he's such an idealist. So uh, this was part of it. The other part that has to be remembered and I feel is forgotten so often is that Kessler did, he was an anti-communist as it was practiced, but he never became a com an anti-communist in the, in the McCarthyist sense. Uh, in fact, he remained a socialist and he voted for the Socialist Party in England, was a big supporter of the Labour Party, but he knew the distinction. Communism is not socialism. Socialism is not communism. And that comes out clearly in this book, I think. So what is the distinction? What is the difference? Because I think that there's something in Darkness at Noon, a way of thinking about, about politics that Rubashov has that I think people don't necessarily understand as easily now because it's not part of our political imagination mm -hmm. anymore. What is the sort of distinctive thing about communism that made it so appealing to Kessler and that made it such a philosophical problem for him that he wanted to write this novel about it? Well, I think uh, the, it's, the, it's the thing that uh, fuels all, uh, all genuine and sincere communists, socialists, uh, liberals, I would say, if we extend it to this country, it was. It, it's a kind of. Um, it's a kind of optimism, a kind of um, a, a hope. It's 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 sort of utopianism in a way. I mean, uh, and communism is, is takes you utopianism in a way to its logical conclusion, and as we know, logical conclusions are very dangerous in politics. Um, so uh, I think that uh, his concern um, was to make the point that the idealism that was experienced by the early Bolsheviks was genuine. They did not realize, realize and did not understand how gradually they went off track. And then once someone like Stalin came to power, uh, the idealism was replaced by a tremendous cynicism which took its place and which was ruthless, I think. And, and hence the word, the mocking oracle we call history. Uh, and I think that the, the, their study of history and their belief that there was a scientific, that, that this was a scientifically a proven uh, uh, evolutionary uh, uh, progress uh, that, that probably led him to, to that conviction. Let me push back a little bit against that because I'm, I'm going to take a more anti-communist line than, than the one you just took. I think you can read the book as saying that, in fact, from the beginning, from Lenin and even from Marx, there's something profoundly wrong about the communist way of thinking about history. And what it is is that it doesn't re believe in the reality of what he calls in the book the grammatical fiction, mm -hmm. which is the I, the individual. That one of the things that Rubashov comes to 
realize because he's now being he's now the victim of the state instead of being one of its enforcers is that communism believes that individuals can be sacrificed for the common good and that no matter how many people the party kills or how many evil deeds it commands you to commit in the end the party is always right and there's the there's the line where he says where uh, Rubishov says to a German communist who he's come to see in Nazi Germany, he says, I can be wrong and you can be wrong, but the party can't be wrong. The party is always right. And that means that anything that the party does has to be right and therefore all of its victims have to be in the wrong. And he really struggles with this idea throughout the course of the book and by the end, I think, comes to the realization that he's been wrong from the start, right? That that way of thinking about history has been wrong from the start because it doesn't recognize the value of the individual. So I think maybe you could, I would say, or I would, my reading of the book is that it's not that the, the communists sort of started out okay and then became bad under Stalin. It's that this basic principle of thinking about history is wrong at the, from the beginning. Do you think that that is right or? Uh, no, I, I, I think that's the conclusion. Uh, but the whole book is about going from the one, one place to the other. I think the sympathy he felt for Bukharin was that Bukharin had a, a, a moral streak. And uh, the, what Rubashov discovers is how far he and the party and Rubashov and company have moved away from that idealist position. Now, whether it, it could ever be brought off or not, I'm not sure. So I sort of agree with you, but, but also think that the, the novel is a, a way of showing how someone like Rubashov could come to understand this, because he himself, is, as you say, he's implicated by his own crimes. The reason, that the end, that he goes voluntarily, or at least um, willingly to his death, is he feels that he has been wrong, that, that he has... He has been unethical uh, and immoral. And I don't want to talk for too long, but if I could just say uh, one important aspect of the novel that I myself did not fully realize until Philip, uh, until I read this version, Philip did the translation, and I read it even more closely than I had before. There's, there's a rather comic figure in the novel who was in the next cell Rubashov, and he's a white, uh, a white um, former military man who's been arrested as a result of the so, uh, the Civil War, uh, uh, and he's remained very conservative and very conventional. And they communicate by tapping on the wall of their cells, which was something that was done in the Soviet Union in those days and in other prisons, actually. And uh, he treats this, uh, Rubashov regards him as a, as a fool. As, and he keeps trotting forward uh, quotations from the Bible and homilies about, uh, about morality uh, uh, and how to behave properly. And as the novel goes on, uh, you find Rubashov gradually, grudgingly, beginning to think, actually, this, what this person's saying. It's very boring, it's very conventional, it's what any average person would say, but it's so. And um, Philip, when you made your, when you were quoting from it, the word decency came up. And I actually, I was surprised it comes up so early in the novel, I'd overlooked that. Because before, just as he's going to his death, uh, Rubashov says, decency is what I lacked. Decency is what one needs for a civilized country to make progress. And it seems such a sort of mild thing compared with the fierce ideology. That, that's where he, he, he came. And in effect, he was saying, not necessarily that white Russians were better than red Russians necessarily, but that without morality, without a code of uh, how to behave, then life was not possible. I think we've unshackled ourselves from the commandments, basically, and we. You know, and it's. He also, in the end, he, he to your point, he discusses the concept of the mass as one mass versus the possibility of a million people. Isn't that a million 
whole individuals. I mean, he, he does go through that uh, thought as well. Yes. Um, that's the question I want to <laughs> let's, I could take a drink first. Um, let's talk about Kessler uh, and some of the other things that he wrote before and after Darkness at Noon. He, communism wasn't the first ideology that he fell in love with. Before he was a communist, he was an ardent Zionist. Um, so, and afterwards, he was sort of interested in other ideologies. I wonder if there's something about him, as he says in his memoir, that he was attracted to utopias and why that was, why utopias had such a, an appeal for him. Oh, that's psychoanalysis. I'm not sure I can... Uh, well, maybe not uh, even in, in psychological terms, but in terms of mm. the times that he lived in. Uh, well, yes. He, uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, one of his ideologies was science. And uh, science uh, hasn't always been that way. It certainly isn't now. But in his day, it was a very optimistic uh, um, subject to be uh, involved in. Um, and I, I think, uh, I think we have to look at the larger picture. I mean, communism, socialism, these were all belief systems, if you like, that came into existence in the early 20th century. I mean, there have been predecessors, and Marx was one, of course. But that was when I think it began to spread more widely. And uh, there was a, a great deal of idealism uh, in the world, and, and this seemed to answer to it. I think one of the one of the reasons that the uh, novel became so such a tremendous success, apart from the anti-communist wave after the war, was that the parties on the left uh, had spent many, uh, and when the novel came out, there, were, there was a great sort of um, uh, debate about what to do about the Soviet Union, because he, remember, he wrote his book in 1939-40, came out in 41. Well, that's when Stalin became an ally of Western Europe, of Britain and France, and eventually of America in the Second World War. So this gave them a tremendous boost and made people think, well, maybe things aren't so bad. This is before we'd heard about the Gulag and so on. So, uh, uh, and then there were an awful lot of time was spent trying to separate out, which, which by the way, uh, I, to declare an interest, uh, I have shared and been a part of, that is to make that distinction between socialism and communism uh, and to uh, underline what I think Kessler really believed in, uh, that it was the totalitarian aspect that was, I'm repeating myself, so uh, I, I think that was very much involved. In other words, others, uh, George Orwell was a case in point who deeply admired Kessler and imitated him in some ways, was someone who was very insistent that, no, the Soviet Union and communism was not what we believe in, but we do believe in something that you might call socialism. Yeah. Um, Philip, Darkness at Noon is maybe along with 1984 are the two most famous books of this period of anti-communism, but it seems like Orwell is probably read a lot more now than Kessler. Why is there a sort of difference in their approach to these issues? Why do you think 1984 is becomes sort of the book that people read in eighth grade, whereas Darkness at Noon is not. Although it used to be. There was a time where, when it used to be. And I think that Orwell's... Uh, the, uh, Michael has a very good point in the introduction that one, uh, one hope for this new uh, edition, and by the way, thanks for, to Scribner for bringing it to print, uh, is that as we have go further away from the realities of that time, this book becomes more allegorical in a way that Orwell has been. And I think that probably that, that allegorical um, approach that Orwell is, makes it more accessible. Uh, this is so grounded in a certain reality, or it was, and so perhaps now it will, will uh, reappear in a more allegorical light, which is something that Michael says in the introduction, um, as a cautionary tale. Uh, I'd like to add a bit about this. I'm often asked, uh, and I think it was being asked by some people before this evening. Um, so what's the relevance today? Why, I mean, apart from this historical reality uh, and this description of the 
of communism, of the ideology uh, of, of its extremism and so on. So what about today? Well, I have a little theory that I've been working on, especially for this evening. Um, when you look around at the world today, uh, you look at, look at somewhere like China, um, like the Soviet Union, but also, let's say, Turkey, possibly that Hungary that your guest uh, comes from, um, uh, and many, many other countries, uh, China as another one, where you get um, regular trials of prominent people, often for corruption. And the way they get them is this, in my view, uh, and I think this relates to Kussler. Kussler uh, decides that, uh, as I mentioned before, that he, he that it is, it, it's, he should be killed uh, because he has committed these crimes. Uh, he also knows that so many of the people that have been killed around him have been killed because they too, in the course of carrying out their party duties, create uh, committed crimes. Well, if you look around at uh, many of authoritarian societies, you will find that, in fact, uh, businessmen are encouraged to be corrupt as long as they pay a, a certain, uh, uh, pay as, uh, I'm trying to think of the word, not tariff, but something like it, to the rulers. In so they are all, Bakshish, Bakshish. Oh, right. thank you, thank you. That, Yes, yes, yes. I, I was, can't think of the actual word I had in mind. So, um, but the thing is that a whole, I'd say a whole class of society or a whole slew of people, they know that, they're, they know that they've profited, they know that they've committed uh, crimes uh, in the genuine sense of the word. Uh, so the ruler can just pick, pick them out one by one, put them out, say, you're corrupt. And you know what, it's true, they are corrupt. Uh, but th that's how the whole system works together. So I would say that what the Communist Party was doing then, uh, and what Rubashov acknowledges is, yes, I am a criminal. I, I brought about the deaths of certain people in Western Germany, in, in not Western Germany, say Nazi Germany, in Holland and so on. So I have no defense. But he was operating under a a moral code which was closer to Christian th than to communist. Well, it's interesting that one thing Rubashov is definitely not is corrupt, right? Because he is not the kind of person who enriches himself mm -hmm. through his political duties or uh, wants to get a, a big house in the country or anything like that. The way we might think of later Soviet um, rulers as being corrupt or having special department stores or mm -hmm. privileges for the, for the apparatchiks, Rubashov is, is one of the old Bolsheviks. He's one of the people who made the revolution. He was a companion of Lenin and a real idealist. And he really believes in, in what he had been doing. And in a way, I think that is one of the hardest things for us to grasp now, or one of the points of, of greatest difference from contemporary politics, is the idea that it's precisely the idealism that makes you evil. It's the idealism that makes you dangerous. It's they not. They can lead you astray. Yeah. What's that? They can lead you astray. Right. Exactly. That it's not that you are using politics in order to advantage yourself. It's that his genuine desire to abolish injustice, um, and as he says in the in the novel, you have to butcher lambs so that lambs won't be butchered in the future. Um, he thinks that what he's doing now by killing people who deserve to be killed, who need to be killed, is he's making the world safer and better for people who we have yet to be born. Um, and that, I think, is, is a real difference. I don't know if you would find anything quite like that in any politics today. Although Castro said, history will absolve me. In, right, right. And so it's still around. Yeah. Um, I think we have time now for some questions from the audience. Uh, and I think we're going to need everyone who asks a question to wait for the microphone. Um, so that they can be heard. But yes, down here. And then in the back row. Um, I, I, I sort of want to challenge uh, the idea um, that that the book is really applicable at this point, uh, somewhat along the lines that that um, that you were just mentioning. The word that sprang out to me when Philip read the uh, the passage that he wrote was impermissible. The notion of, of sort of the impermissible 
the notion of a sort of a system, uh, a, a, a formal system of ideas to which one owes an allegiance, uh, in this case, separate from religious, that is that impermissible is kind of a secular word, it's not forbidden, which would be a more religious word. Um, um, I'm not, yeah, I'm not certain that I, that I, I mean, Castro, that Castro's dead. Um, um, I'm not certain how much one sees that kind of true believerism in the uh, in the um, authoritarian states that we're looking at now. It, it seems much more, to me anyway, it seems much more chaotic, much more disruptive. To use a, a you know kind of a difficult word for it, um, and I wonder whether there's a way that 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 in the interests of darkness at noon, whether that gap can be breached at all so that we can talk about the book actually speaking to the situations that we see now. That seems directed at me, I think, or to me. Uh, well, w what I'm trying to say is that, the, that beyond the ideology, whether it's a communist ideology or a business ideology, let's just say, uh, it's when people are induced to commit wrongs um, because, well, and to come to back to something that, that also came up, it book is also about ends and means. Uh, you do the ends, and there's the, this quotation from Machiavelli at the very beginning, this epigraph, uh, which I can't remember by heart, but uh, uh, which is about ends and means. So whether the end is this ideal life, this ideology, this communist life, or the end is enrichment uh, at all costs, as it were. And when you come to a barrier, a moral barrier, let's say, and you say, well, uh, I'm improving the economy, or I need to do this because uh, I will get richer, but other people will get richer as well, knowingly committing a crime. I think that takes them across the line uh, that that's a psychology, which is what I'm trying to describe, which transcends the time and that particular ideology. Well, what do you think about contemporary relevance? Uh, well, as I said before, it's about a man who, um, who has a vision but cannot see. It's about someone who sacrifices compassion for his convictions, for political convictions, and so uh, I think that's what also Michael is suggesting, that uh, we see a lot of that. Uh, we see a lot of, um, uh, there's a question of or uh, orthodoxy and heresy, partisanship, uh, you know, if you're not with me, you're against me. Uh, so that I think the, the, the relevance is, is there. It may take a, a less uh, severe form, as David was suggesting, just, you know, we have to extend the, the metaphors a bit, but um, that's, that would be, for me, the, the, the relevance in our daily situation. At the back there, this poor gentleman in the end. Yes. Thank you. I have a question about the translation. I'm assuming that Daphne Hardy and Kirstler went back and forth when the book was being translated into English from, from the German. So how good was Kirstler's English at this point? This would have, and, and how good was her German? Uh, well, uh, they were they were they were both almost fluent in those two languages, uh, but Daphne Hardy most of her education took place in Germany and Holland. She was in English schools in in those countries because of her father's occupation. Uh, Kussler had acquired a a a very good English by this time, but wasn't a hundred percent fluent. I I think that the when it comes to the translation, part of the issue uh, was that although Kussler's English was very good, I, now this is guesswork, by the way, because uh, I don't know for sure, but, uh, I, but I know that uh, Kussler's English was very good. But for instance, there, were a lot, there are a lot of words that carry over from German to English because it's the same, and Philip will back me up on this, they, but they're portmanteau words, you know, they're hyphenated words, uh, which you can do in English, but to an Englishman don't sound fluent. So I think there was some, his, since he was the far stronger of the two uh, uh, 
um, psychologically. I think he may have pushed some vocabulary on her that she might not have used, uh, or it might not have been her first choice. The other thing, as Philip said earlier, is it was done at enormous speed. I mean, I, I can't, I, I'm a translator as well, or have been. I don't know about Phil, Philip, but can you imagine actually translating something, uh, a, a text which has just been hot off the press and is just handed to you? Uh, and we know that Kussler had second uh, thoughts and, and made some changes himself later. So I, I think it was just a, a, a chaotic situation that, uh, uh, and, but I'd like to add, um, I, I met Daphne Hardy and interviewed her, and uh, she did a marvelous job for someone who was 21 years old. And add to that, that is her title, Darkness at Noon. Thanks. Um, to come back to the modern relevance revel uh, for a second, um, if one of the themes of the book is uh, what happens when people are uh, driven to maintain ideological orthodoxy and not strain from that purity of thought, uh, a single iota. I mean, one irony occurs to me as I uh, observed is that, um, you know, you, you all have written for the New York Review of Books. Uh, the editor there had to leave because he published a piece by someone who was uh, accused of uh, uh, bad sexual things, although acquitted, I guess. Uh, so I understand it. Uh, Mr. Kessler had a, uh, what we might call today, a problematic uh, personal life. And there are probably some people who would say, you know what, um, I mean, on the same logic, I mean, there are people who would say, you know, this, as a result, this book should not be uh, read and we shouldn't be having this event uh, in a good cause, presumably. Uh, discuss. <laughs> Who wants to jump in on that one? Um, I'd say the difference is this, that what Kessler is writing about with, with Rubishov is people who think that they're doing something good and in order to do something good, do something that's actually evil. Whereas the situations that you're talking about and the phenomenon that, we're do that you're sort of alluding to today is people who did things that they knew were wrong and that they are being uh, punished for them. Now you can say how much is punishment is right, what's the right punishment for what case, but I think that, that there is a, a real difference. The difference is um, that, I, to me, the relevance of the book is primarily for the left, and it has to do with thinking that you, because you, what you want is good, that anything you do in the pursuit of what you want also has to be good. I mean, that's the means and ends issue. Although it would apply to the right as well, any, to any ideologically based uh, behavior, right? So it's well, less so, I think. I, I think it is primarily a, 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 less, a warning to the left, and I think that if you, if you look at the political situation in which Kessler was writing, um, no one, no enlightened person, no, no sort of liberal person thought that Hitler was good, right? Everyone knew that the, the world view that Hitler was, the world that Hitler wanted to create was evil. Everyone, everyone of liberal principles could see that. Um, but the world that Stalin wanted to create, a lot of people thought was good. And that's why a lot of people had a lot of patience for Stalin much more than Hitler, even if you look at the number of people they killed are comparable. So, and I think that that remains to this day, that people to this, to this day, Nazism and the swastika are instantly recognizable symbols of evil, whereas communism and the hammer and sickle are not in the same way. I mean, for instance, there's a bar in downtown Manhattan called the KGB bar, which has um, communist paraphernalia in it in a sort of ironic uh, kitsch spirit. You wouldn't have a Gestapo bar. Although, um, although, <laughs> uh, although at the time, the, the fact that Hitler's rise was supported by as many people and the, this question of decency, you know, how many of those decent yeah. burgers were supporting this and not believing, not recognizing the evil or not believing it to be evil. And so that's another yeah. uh, ideological mindset. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, um, my 
feeling when I first read the book, and that was years ago because I'm uh, getting on, um, was that it was a cautionary tale against self-delusion. And I think that remains completely valid right now. It's, uh, you know, it, for me, that was the main thing. I grew up in France, which was at that time very much, you know, sort of oriented left, basically. You know, the Communist Party was, had been part of the government, was still, and a lot of young people like myself, in spite of having a strong interest in the history of Eastern Europe, uh, would, you know, be sort of interested at least, if not attracted. And reading Darkness at Noon, which in French for some reason is called Zero and Infinity, um, was, uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm not sure why, but that's the title, Zero et Infini. And uh, that was really a cautionary tale, and it gave me pause. And I think if it does that now, and prevents people from believing that doing bad in a good cause is acceptable, I think that's a very valid book. Michael, you say in your biography that there's a theory that the French elections of 1946 were tipped by Darkness at Noon because it was such a phenomenon that it, it made the elections go against the communists. Uh, yes, that's true. I mean, that's, that's one example of a, a book of words actually having an enormous impact on the politics of the day. Uh, so, uh, and France was a very interesting place for a book like this to appear uh, because the French take politics seriously. The French take ideas uh, seriously. And by the way, I'd like to say that was a brilliant insight that you just gave us. I wish I'd thought of it myself. <laughs> <laughs> Do you it, know who came up with the French title? Uh, no, I, no I, I think it was the translator. Um, who was resident in, in England. But uh, the French also had this saying at that time, and it, I think it continued for a while, no enemies on the left, which left, left the left very vulnerable to communism because if there could be no enemies on the left, then there's no end to how far you can go. We have time for one more question. Yes. In walking back, uh, Kessler's moral relativism to the American Communist Party before and after the McCarthy era. There were many American communists who were passionate, ardent zealots who went to the Soviet Union, who got stuck there, became disillusioned, and couldn't come back. And my question relates to Paul Robeson. How did somebody of his intellectual caliber get sucked in by being convinced that communism was great. In one way, he was exchanging the ideology of American slavery for the Soviet ideology of communism. Right, and not, and not just Robeson. I mean, you could say that many of the best minds of the 20th century were communists, and why, why is that? <laughs> Let's answer that question <laughs> once and for all. Have you got a couple of hours? Yeah. I still couldn't resolve it. Um, no, what occurs to me offhand, and, and it's based partly on not the kind of personal experience that someone like Robeson had, but on uh, early experiences I, I felt. That is, I think, if you feel for any reason that there is injustice in this world, um, and if there's, there's an injustice that affects you and you think that someone else could is already doing what they can to reduce or eliminate injustice in this world, then I think there's likely to be an attraction. The other thing is uh, we, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Kessler was writing long before the Gulag Archipelago. Now, I, I come from a left-wing family, a left-wing British family, uh, that in the war used to take the Soviet weekly because they were our allies. And it took them and it took me a long time to understand what actually went on in the Soviet Union. You have to remember there was a complete blackout. The Iron Curtain was even more iron when it came to information. So we had these, one had these images, and I assume Paul Robeson had them too, of these genuinely brave and self-sacrificial Soviet soldiers going into battle, dying in their thousands, but winning 
their battles, and in the end, turning the tide of the war. So someone like Robeson and many other people would give them the benefit of the doubt, not really knowing about those millions of deaths, which is why uh, when he wasn't the first, but Solzhenitsyn was the most eloquent among the people to bring this home to audiences in the West, to people in the West, just how bad and, and how much like the Holocaust it was, as you mentioned. <laughs> oh, thank you. A brilliant job of moderating this fascinating conversation. Philip, Michael, thank you so much for your insights. We invite you upstairs to share again. Thank you very much.